Good morning and welcome to worship on this first Sunday in Lent. To work through the Lenten season to uh, dig deeper into the meaning of this sacred time, we are doing a Lenten study together as a church. It's called The God We Can Know, and it's about exploring the I Am sayings of Jesus. So both the worship service message and the readings that we do during the week will be uh, from this book. And um, if you would like to join us, we offer classes on Sunday uh, after worship, and um, that one begins today. The Tuesday classes are at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. They are Zoom classes, as is the Sunday class, and those uh, began last week, but you are still welcome to join us on Zoom. Uh, if you want to participate in any of those classes, please call the church office. We will make sure that you get the Zoom link, and you can also pick up your book there. Books are $9. Uh, we had quite a snow this past week, and we all kind of scrambled to review what the church's snow policy is. So uh, better late than never, just a reminder that if the schools are closed for a snow day, then the programming of the church is also uh, canceled for that day, with the exception of Zoom classes, classes that are done online. Those may meet safely. Uh, but if there is a meeting or something that is scheduled to be done at the church, then those things are are not meeting and the office will be closed on snow days. So just keep that in mind. We are glad that you have chosen to be with us today. Uh, I am Reverend Suzanne Goodwin. I am so pleased to serve here at this church. If you are new with us, we're happy to have you uh, worshiping with us and we hope to meet you in person sometime soon. We just hope this pandemic will move along and, and be done with and that we can gather again together in this sacred space. Please join us this morning in our call to worship. We worship a remarkable God, a God who is the great I am, a God who creates and is yet creating, a God whose love and mercy are without end. Let us open our hearts and worship our God. Let us lift our voices and sing God's praise. One of the wonderful blessings of being part of a church family is the opportunity that we have to pray with each other and for each other. This past week, we have had some serious prayer concerns. Um, last Friday, 
afternoon, and this was after we had already pre-recorded the worship service, uh, Deb Darling's uh, father passed away in a house fire. And so we are extending our um, sympathy and our prayers for the Darling family, for Deb's family, her mother, um, in the wake of this really tragic event. Uh, Vic Whipple passed away on Wednesday evening, and so we uh, extend our prayers to his family in this time of grief as well. We want to be praying for Phyllis Beisch, who is recovering at home from some procedures that she had in the hospital. We extend our sympathies to Nancy Donovan, who lost her sister this past week and who will be having a heart cath procedure in the upcoming week. We continue to pray for Dick Magsig, Lou Tibbetts, Ken Gettler, and Chris Darian, um, who are all facing uh, health challenges as well. And just because we need some good and uplifting um, news, we are rejoice with the Page family as they have welcomed a new grandchild. So, uh, so many things to be in prayer for, things that we name out loud, things that are deep in our hearts, and of course, the prayer concerns of our community and world that only God knows about. Let us go to God in prayer. O holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, for each day that we rise and have opportunity to breathe in the beauty of your creation and give thanks for the miracles and mysteries of the life that surrounds us. We are grateful for every opportunity we have to worship you because it reminds us that we are made in your image to have a purpose that is about love and kindness and generosity. Merciful God, in this season of Lent, we contemplate the things that we have allowed to take place of importance in our lives, things that are maybe not as important as we have made them to be, things that we have allowed to draw our focus from the things that are truly important. O oh Lord, each and every day, give us clean hearts and fresh spirits. May our lives focus on your love and your calling for us to rise and to be better people than we ever thought we could be. Forgive us, O oh God, for our missteps and our thoughtlessness. Heal us from our inclination toward unkind thoughts. Work in us and through us that we might see new opportunity each and every day to love your people as you have asked us to do. Lord, we ask your blessing and healing grace on our congregation, especially those we have named this morning. We ask your comfort and grace on Deb Darling and her grieving family. We ask that you surround the Whipple family as they grieve the passing of Vic, who faithfully served this church. We pray for Nancy Donovan as she grieves the loss of her sister and as she continues to maintain her health so that she may look forward to time with George. We pray for Phyllis Beisch, who received disappointing news on her health this past week. We pray for Glenda Kreider, recovering after a recent stroke. We continue to pray for Ken Gettler, and we pray for Chris Darian, offering our thanks for medical advances that extend life in the face of devastating diseases. And Lord, we lift to you all members of our church family who are dealing with the impact of COVID as well as those who are isolated in nursing homes. Lord, these are the names of people that we love and have concern for, but there are many who have not been named and many people who are friends we have not yet met. And we ask your healing touch on all of them, wherever they may be. Grant them an awareness of your immediate and intimate grace that they may be comforted and at peace. Lord, we continue to pray for our nation and our world. No matter how large the scope, we are all your children, one family, figuring out how to get along, how to survive the challenges of weather and climate, how to beat back a virus, how to simply be loving neighbors to one another. We ask for wisdom and courage for all leaders. We ask for peace in our hearts and peace in our land. May all we say and do 
be about bringing your kingdom to reality. Lord, all of this we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I have some updates on some other things that are going on in the church. Um, the Staff Parish Relations Committee has been busy uh, on a couple of fronts. Uh, you may know that we are trying to find a new building manager, as Jeff Lotzenheiser is going to be retiring soon. He actually should have retired already, um, but it has been difficult finding someone to fill this position. We believe we have a candidate, and we're in the final stages of trying to um, determine whether this is the right choice for our church, and so hopefully we will have an announcement soon. But just please be in prayer for the Staff Parish Relations Committee uh, as they continue to do this important work. We also are getting close to um, being able to make an offer for someone to serve as our Director of Family Ministries, and that is very exciting. So please be in prayer again for that person as, as they do the work of discernment necessary to take on this really significant ministry here in the life of our church. Our missions committee met recently. We are continuing to have conversation about what God is calling us to do in light of the overall work and mission of the church. We have been doing some work of discernment and trying to identify exactly what it is that our church does. And we have identified three main callings that God has placed on us. One is to help people grow in faith. The second is to serve others. And the third is to simply share the love of Christ with all people. And so each of these segments are served by various ministries in our church. Of course, growing in faith falls under um, the realm of Christian education, and so therefore we offer classes and, and programs and ministries to help people grow in faith. And our mission group is primarily focused on how do we serve others? How do we do that well? And then, of course, hospitality is part of how we share the love of Christ. This week, we had our, um, our prayer walk, which was an offering for Ash Wednesday that both was about growing in faith, it was about worship, and it was about extending hospitality to the community around us. And we had people come and go through the prayer walk who were not of our church family. Uh, so that was a wonderful thing to see, to know that we are extending God's love and grace to the community around us. This is what we do here in our church. This is how we answer God's call. And so we come to this time in our worship service where we offer up our gifts as an act of worship and we, and we offer our offerings um, because we are grateful for the way God has blessed our church and our lives personally. And our generosity then becomes the work of the church that makes these things happen. It all works together for God's goodness and God's grace. Let us continue to be generous people together. Let us pray. O holy and loving God, you have been a generous God with our church and with us. We give you thanks and we joyfully bring our offerings to you that they might be used to make a difference in the world, to invite your people into community with us in this church. Lord, we lift all of our gifts. May they be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us sing together our doxology.
This morning we have two scripture readings. The first is from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is who, that I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. And this from Isaiah 41, chapter 41, verse 10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. These are the words of God for the people of God, for which we say, thanks be to God. I may have shared this story with you before, but a couple of years ago, a couple of my clergy buddies decided to write uh, their own Lenten devotion for their churches, and the three of them went in together, each writing two chapters for this book that they wrote, this small Lenten devotion book. In one of the chapters that my friend Amy wrote, she posed this question, what kind of savior chooses to be born in a stable? What kind of king chooses to make his entry into the city of Jerusalem on a humble donkey rather than a noble white steed? I found these questions to be incredibly profound, really, truly profound. First, because these questions cue us to deeper consideration of our expectations of a king or a god or savior. The Israelites really struggled with this expectation of what power and leadership would look like. And Jesus wasn't it. And I think to some degree we have the same problem. Do we really understand and have an appreciation for what it means to have the ability the divine power to rule the world, and yet the wisdom not to use it. The divine power to live in wealth and luxury, and yet choose to commingle it with the, low, with the lowest members of society. What kind of king is this? What kind of God is this? And you know, I don't think we spend nearly enough of our time and effort considering this. Who is this God that we worship? And do we understand the magnitude of a God whose greatest priority is not to force his dominion upon us, 
but rather to encourage us to love our way to the highest form of being that we can attain. When I think of leaders of the past century, I can probably count on one hand the leaders who saw their leadership as a call to serve and who truly used their position to uplift the people. In contrast to what we see in leadership today, this God is a God that we want to know better. In the face of our frustration about human leadership, whose MO seems to be entirely about sustaining their own power, we should be hugely intrigued by this God who has it, and yet doesn't force it upon us, but instead encourages us to choose to follow it of our own volition. This is a God who should be the subject of our intense fascination. We should be so compelled to know this God that our attention can barely focus elsewhere. During this season of Lent, we are offering a study called The God We Can Know, exploring the I Am sayings of Jesus. Jesus said things like, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the Good Shepherd, and so forth. What was Jesus trying to tell us about himself and about God? For the next six weeks, we'll be looking at six different I am statements that Jesus made and how they help us to know God better. One of the things we see when we take a macro look at the Bible in other words, when we look at the Bible in totality, rather than zooming into tiny snippets of it, is we see this evolution of God's relationship with humanity. And as we look at the whole picture, we get a sense of God's steadfast effort to maintain connection with us. God wants us to know God. God wants to be recognized. We often speak of relationship with God, but I still think that we don't quite get it. And that's fair. It's hard to have a relationship with someone you can't see or hear. The very nature of God is that the essence of God is outside our understanding. And how do we relate to someone who is outside our understanding? But the Bible is the story of God's never-ending attempt to reach us and have a close, personal, immediate relationship with us. The truth is revealed in the Genesis story that depicts God's presence walking with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the evening. In the early days of the patriarchs, God would speak directly to them. And then you had the prophets and the kings who showed up later, and God would talk to them so that they could then convey God's message to the people. And even when people would hide from God, God would seek them out. God wants to be recognized. God wants us not to just know him, but to rely on him. Think about it this way. Have you ever watched your child struggle with something and you know they're going about it all wrong and you know that you have the answer that would save them from the disastrous consequences that they are surely going to face and you just want to save them from their own ineptitude and so you say, I can help you, to which they respond with a belligerent, I don't want your help. I can do it myself. And so you stand by, ready and willing to offer your assistance, waiting for them to recognize that just maybe you do have their best interests at heart. So it is with God, who knows he can surely help us to live better lives and who is just standing and waiting for us to get a clue, waiting for us to recognize him. God is not hiding from us. 
God does not avoid us. God wants to be known. And the real question here is, do we want to know God? Our quick response is probably, yes, of course, I want to know God. But our long-term history does not bear this out. The truth is that our effort to reach God can be rather half-hearted at times. Well, God wants more than anything to reach us and to be part of our lives. The nature of this relationship is so beautifully and clearly depicted in Michelangelo's painting in the Sistine Chapel where you see God straining to reach Adam. He's got his finger fully outstretched towards Adam. And Adam's kind of reclining lazily with his hand resting on his knee and his finger just kind of loosely dangling there. This incredible painting captures the break in the relationship which God yearns to fix and which we only put forth a minimum amount of effort. But our need for God is another story. Daily, daily, we encounter situations where we feel like we're in over our heads. We need someone more powerful than we are. We need someone who knows more than we do. We need someone who can solve and fix and banish our problems. We need someone who can give us confidence when we're fearful and love when we feel alone. This someone who can do all that is the God that we are searching for. This is the God who seeks us out earnestly and who wants us to know him well enough that we will turn to him in the midst of our most trying times and in our moments of extreme joy. This is the God who reached out to Moses on a mountainside in the form of a burning bush. This is God trying to get the attention of the man whom he has chosen to be the rescuer of the Hebrew people who are enslaved in Egypt. Moses is overwhelmed with the magnitude of the task that God is giving him. And he protests and he offers a litany of excuses for why he's not up to this task not the least of which is the question of, by what authority will anyone take me seriously? Why would the Pharaoh listen to Moses? And maybe more importantly, why would the Israelite people listen to him? And Moses asks God, when the Israelites ask me who sent me, what should I tell them? And God replies, I am who I am. Now, there are several really interesting things about this reply and how it's presented in literary and written form. First, the Hebrew name for God is Yahweh. It's Y-H-W-H, -Y Yahweh. But because it's such a sacred name, the Hebrew people never speak it for fear of taking the name of God in vain. So they refer to God's name as Adonai, which translates in English to my Lord. So when you're reading your Bible and you see the name of God depicted as Lord with a capital L and then small caps O-R-D, what is behind that is the combination of letters that indicate Yahweh, the proper name for God. By the way, for many years, this Hebrew was mistranslated as J-H-V-H -H and interpreted as Jehovah, which is a misspelling and mispronunciation of Yahweh. But as we read the account of God's conversation with Moses, we see God's response also depicted in the same way we see Yahweh translated as Lord in small caps. Now we see I am who I am also in small caps because this is God's self-described identity. God is trying to tell us who God is. I am who I am. This is really important. 
Like many other things in the Bible, this concept that God has presented does not translate well to modern English. Translators have done the best they can, but modern social linguists will tell you that there is no clear translation to convey the mystery encapsulated in God's response. I am is as close as we can come to conveying that present tense existence, the immediate and intimate presence of God's being. God is saying, I am present, I'm here, I exist. I am a unique identity located with you. What does that mean? Well, the first thing we pick up on is the present tenseness of this response. It's not historical, although God often does make known that information as well. I am the God of your ancestors, which is another way of God saying, I was present with those who have gone before. God often establishes his record of presence. But in this case, what he's saying to Moses is, I am present with you here and now. I am. In God's response to Moses, he's not talking about an abstract promise for the future. He's not saying, I'll be there when you need me. Instead, God depicts himself as, I am. I am in this moment and in all moments where you need me to be. I am a present God. I exist. I am here. I am who I am. On casual reading, it may sound flippant, but when you dwell on what's being said in these simple words, it is a strong and beautiful response. So what does that mean for us? How does this help us to know God better? Rob Fuquay, the author of this study we're reading, conveys the story of a Christian comedian who was spontaneously asked to perform for inmates at a maximum security prison. He agreed, but immediately began to panic and have anxiety, thinking, what am I going to say to these people? I'm not prepared for this. Will they think anything that I have to say is funny? And he remembers thinking, as he was being led through the security rooms, Lord, now would be a really great time to give me something funny to say. And as he gets to the front of the group of waiting inmates, his mind is a complete blank. And he steps up to the microphone, and as his feet hit that spot where he's supposed to stand, he looks down into the front row, and he sees a man with a long white beard, and his name is Moses. And he realizes that God has delivered. And he thinks, thank you, Lord. I can do something with this. And he says to the group, who better to be in prison with than a guy named Moses? And he points at the guy and he says, you need to go to the warden right now and say, let my people go. And of course, the crowd loved it. What was life-changing for the comedian, though, was the realization that God would give him what he needed when his feet were where God wanted them to be. And the same is true for Moses. Moses had no way of fully understanding the magnitude of events that would transpire with God's help. What God wanted Moses to understand was that God would be present when his feet were where God wanted them to be. How true is that for us? I can attest to my own truth in my own life. I have wandered in directions that I thought would bring my life meaning or bring me security or love or happiness. But I have found God to be profoundly present when my feet are where God wants me to be. And it's not just your feet that matter. Perhaps a more truthful way of saying this would be to say, I have found God to be present when my head is where God wants it to be, or where my heart is how God wants it to be, or when my prayers or my thoughts or my actions. 
God is a God of intimate presence. God exists. God is now. God is here. God is with you. God is. Fuquay says, God works in real time. And it's so true. So in the early years, God interacts with the Israelite people, trying to maintain relationship with them, trying to help them understand that the fullness of life comes from a willingness to allow God's love and guidance to be their way of life. But they're just not getting it. And so God sends Jesus. And in time, Jesus begins to teach and witness, and many of his teachings are about helping people to know who God is through Jesus. And as he teaches, he builds on what God started when he said to Moses, I am who I am. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Taking that essence of God's declaration and adding an elemental concrete item that people can relate to in order to provide further clarification. I am the bread of life. I am the food that sustains you so that you can have life. I am present. I exist. I am now. I am sustenance. I am energy. I am nutrition for your soul. By building on God's declaration, Jesus is helping us to know God better. But not just that we might know God better, but also so that we might get to know ourselves better. For we are made in the image of God. We are made in the likeness of God. So we resemble our heavenly parent in character and personhood. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, but he also said, you are the light of the world. Of course, because we are God's children. We resemble our parent who brings light to humanity. So we too should bring light to humanity. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. But he also said, feed my sheep. When we acknowledge God as the parent of our being, the one who gives us life, we accept that we have inherited God's traits the ability to create, the ability to love and choose and forgive and have compassion. We are children of I am, with love and with divine purpose. In this first week of Lent, I ask you to consider the following things. How do you understand the I amness of God? How is God intimately present with you? Are you doing all you can to open your eyes and recognize God and let him fill you up? In what way do you resemble your heavenly parent? Are you using these features wisely? Are you making good use of your inheritance? In these weeks of Lent, I invite you to actively expand your awareness so that you might more completely recognize the God who is. The God who is, I am. Amen. Let us pray. Great and gracious God, thank you for never giving up on us. Thank you for your yearning to bring us into closer relationship with you. Thank you for your immediate and abiding presence. Continue to work in us and strengthen us as we draw closer to you. Stir up in us a desire to love as you love, to serve as you serve, to be grace as you have been grace to us. All of this we ask in the name of Jesus, who is the Savior of us all. Amen. Let us sing together our closing hymn. Thank you. And to 
called to grow and serve and share God's love. We are called to be in ministry according to our gifts and graces. As you enter into the week ahead, one way you can grow in faith is to participate in our Lenten study. If you need a book, I believe we still have them in the church office, please feel free to stop by and pick one up. And one way you can serve others is to drop off some canned goods for the tiny pantry out front. It is getting a lot of use, and we certainly could use your help there. And one way you can share God's love is to offer a word of encouragement to those who have been confined for all this time due to the pandemic. We need to let people know that they are remembered, that we miss them, that we love them. Let us, in this Lenten season, resolve to share the fullness of God's love and grace. May God's peace be upon you all. Amen. <laughs>